He's saying, my soul right now, it's like they left what I'm desiring out there in the field. It went to rot. I can't get a taste of it. Well, what does he desire? Well, he says, the good man has perished out of the earth, and there's none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. They say, all that I want is people to do what God wants people to do. He's saying people have left the good things, the fruit of God. They left that in the vineyard. They left that out on the farm. And everything that they bring in, it's filled with lust, envy, hate. I mean, it could be malice, bitterness, enviness. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to put away all those things with malice. Especially after we've been made into the new creature. Right? We're supposed to put them away, not just, you know, timidly, with malice. We're supposed to hate them things. Like Job, who was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. Not because it was evil, but because evil kept him from being in the good graces of God. That's why he hated it. He hated it because it kept him from the thing that he loved the most, the Lord. Here, the prophets say, they don't do that no more. They heap to themselves those things that are bitter in the eyes of God, but they love the taste of it. He says that they lie in wait for their brothers with a net. Why? Because verse number 3, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. Okay, you ever, you know, all those movies, somebody will reach out and shake your hand, or the cartoons, and what do they do? They put their other hand behind their back, and they got their fingers crossed. Right? Well, what's that? Well, they seem to do good with one hand, but then in the other, they do evil. Okay, that's majority of the time, you could say, hey, that person out there in the world, they do things like that. Can't trust anybody nowadays. Right? Well, here, you didn't want to trust anybody because they did both hands. Evil. All the time. Earnestly, it says. You know, that means they've given themselves completely over to doing evil. This is what that word lasciviousness means in the Bible. You got a piece of ice. Lasciviousness means that you can do whatever you want without any moral hesitation, without any conviction from your own soul or from your conscience. Okay, for a child of God, it means that you're so far away from God that the Holy Ghost isn't going to deal with you. Because if the Holy Ghost deals with you, you've got conviction, you've got reservations. Right. True lasciviousness means you do evil and it doesn't bother you no more. And you've given yourself over to evil. That's where these people are. It says, the prince asketh, and the judge asketh for the reward. They're corrupt. The ruler says, hey, I want to get this done. And the judge says, we can do that for a price. What's in it for me? Then it says, after the judge asked for a bribe, and the great man, he utters his mischievous desire. So they wrap it up. What's the great man? The powerful man. The one with authority. The prince. He makes known his evil desire. And then the judge says, well, as long as you pay me, we can button this thing up and get it done right now. There's no hesitation to do anything as long as you get something out of it. They would destroy their own brother to inherit that brother's inheritance. You don't believe me? Verse number four. The best of them is a briar. Well, when the best thing you got is a burr underneath of the saddle of everybody else as, as I too good when the best thing you have still causes you pain that, that's a bad spot but then he says the most upright is sharper than a thorn edge uh, anybody ever been to Disney World I, I think they have one at Disneyland too but Splash Mountain you know when you go down that big hill and the drop happens what do you go through you go through the briar patch there's a whole bunch of fake briars all over the place. And then once upon a time, we rode that ride. This is a funny story. A Christian, and I may have helped out a little bit. <laughs> she didn't really believe him until I said, oh no, that's, that's, that's true. Then she believed it. But Christian told Aunt Lynn at Disney World that if you sit in the front row of the log flume, the water splash goes over your head. And it gets to the people in the second row. 
and Aunt Lynn was very wet for the rest of the day, and it was very funny. But, <laughs> hey, that's what I said. Verse number five, trust not a friend, trust not a guide. <laughs> Don't trust Christian. Okay? But no. When it's saying that the breast of the, the most upright, the one that you would look and say, that guy's a good person. Any way you go around that guy, you're going to get caught in that thorn hedge. Like a briar patch. That's why briar rabbit kept going back to the briar patch. Why? Because the bad guys couldn't get him. He was small enough to get around and get through it, but everybody else, they'd get caught up in it. They couldn't get to him. It was a defense. But when the most upright, everywhere you go, you're getting caught, you're getting tangled, you're getting poked and cut and everything else, that's not, good. not a good society. Okay, it was a desperate time. It says, The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. In other words, God's going to do something about it and they're not going to be able to figure it out. To be perplexed means you, you can't find out why it happened, how it happened, how to prevent it. You didn't even see it coming. It leaves you speechless. That's what perplexed means. Well, why is this judgment coming? Well, verse number five, trust you not in a friend. A friend is someone that knows your strengths and all your weaknesses, and they still choose to be your friend. You choose to associate with someone. Well, people in this day and age may claim to be your friend, but they're not there for mutual gain. They're there for a selfish reason. So he's saying, trust not those that say they're your friend, or you may think that they're your friend. Don't trust them. Trust Put not confidence in a guide. Don't trust somebody who's giving you directions. Someone says, here, I'll mentor you. Well, he may say that he's going to mentor, but he may take every dollar that you have. He may take advantage of you and keep you as an apprentice when you've got all the skills necessary to go out and do the job on your own. He may have you do all the work, and he sits back and do, does nothing. Or, just like Joseph in the Coat of Many Colors, just like so many uh, movies. Yeah, I know where you're going, and then they take you in, and then, oh, hey, we put you into an ambush, give us everything you own, then they leave you on the side of the road to nothing. They claim to be a guide, but they're a burglar in disguise, a wolf in sheep's clothing, as the New Testament would call it. Okay, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. He's saying you can't even trust your own wife. He say she may have said that she loved you and married you, but maybe once she finds out, you know, how much or how little money you have, she's going to get rid of you to either get the money or find somebody that doesn't have a little bit of money. That's how wicked and perverse the day and age was in Micah's day. He's, he's praying for God's judgment. Now see, I want you to notice in verse number 7, or verse number 6, sorry. The son dishonoreth the father. No respect for authority. The daughter rises up against her mother. Well, what's that? Well, the Bible teaches us that the home is the mother's domain. That that's her place to raise the children, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Certainly, the father should help out. Right? The mother's home, it's her home. So when the daughter doesn't want to do what the mother says, what's that? They don't want to learn righteousness, they want to do what they want to do. Rebellion. Sound familiar? The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Again, look at Ruth. Naomi told Ruth and Ruth's sister-in-law, Naomi told both of her daughter-in-laws, y'all can go back to your own people. That was a mercy, Brother Bob, because custom dictated if you were in a family and your husband died, you stayed at the husband's father's house. Until either he allowed you to marry somebody else, or until a kinsman redeemer came along and redeemed the family. Naomi let that go, but Ruth purposed, no, I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to stick with you. Ruth did what she was supposed to, but the other one, she forsook the mother-in-law. What's that? This is a statement on choices. That's why they call it the in-laws, because... They may not be your mother by birth. They may not be your father by birth. may not be your brother by birth or your sister by birth. 
But when you choose to enter that family, you voluntarily say, I want to be associated with y'all. Because I love this person so much, I'll put up with the rest of y'all. But just because situations change, the daughter-in-law rising up against the mother-in-law, that only happens if the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law are in the same house. That means the son's gone away. All loyalty is gone once what you want is out of the picture. Well, your son's not around no more. So I'm not around no more. That's not the way things worked back in the day. In the eyes of God, you make a commitment, you stick to it. Doesn't matter what the situation's, you know, dictate or change. If you make a vow before God, you better keep it. If you make a promise to God, you better remember it. Here he's saying people don't care about commitments any longer. Then it says, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Those that are supposed to be for you the most are the ones that are out to get you the most in Micah's day. So he says in verse 7, Therefore, I will look into the Lord. In other words, he's saying there's no hope in the world. He says there's not even people out there that are living righteously, deciding righteously. Nobody wants to be concerned with the things of God. So he says, so I'll look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Well, there's his faith. He knows it's the right thing to look towards God. But it's another thing to say, I will wait for the God of my salvation. That's faith. He will hear me. He's saying, even though I'm in a sin-cursed land, even though I'm among a sin-cursed people that have turned their back on God, I believe that God will still listen to those that try to live as God told them to live. I still believe that those that he chose, because in the Old Testament, these are God's chosen people, in the New Testament, we receive the adoption of sonship. They didn't have that back in the day. But through the blood of Jesus, now we do. Well, what's that mean? He's saying, I just believe that the father will listen to his son if the son's really concerned with doing business with the father. If he's willing to come to the father on the father's terms, I believe that the father will hear him. Well, he says, verse number 8, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. But why does he call him his enemy? I mean, he said in verse number 6, A man's enemies are the men of his own house. We have to define an enemy. Well, an enemy does not have to be someone that you are face-to-face -face with, fighting tooth and nail. There are a whole lot of enemies that you never see. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual weakness, and a high place. What's all that? That's sin. That's wickedness. That's evil. It's the curse that was brought into this world. It's the driving motivations that the devil and his angels use to try and corrupt men, to keep them away from God, to entice them away from the things of God. That's what we wrestle with. And most often, we don't even wrestle with those things because we can't get past our own flesh to get out there and try and live holy for God and to confront those things. He's saying, there are enemies... They're the enemies in your own house. But you don't have to be fighting them every day as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Sometimes your enemies could be in your house. They may not be trying to kill you, but they may hate everything that you stand for. There are people in the Middle East that may not be at war with us right now, or maybe, depending on who you ask. But they hate everything that we stand for at the Emmanuel Baptist Church. If they had their way, they would wipe us off the map. There are those people out there. There are people in America that want to take your Bible away from you. There are people in our country that believe you, you aren't smart enough to make your own choices, so they want to take your free will away from you. And the decisions that they want to make are the dumbest ideas that I've ever heard of. One lady put together this thing called a Green New Deal and wanted to get rid of all the cows because the cows, when they eat things make gas in their stomach and it comes out their rear end and that's causing more of a problem in the global warming situation because they're making so much gas out their rear ends so she wanted to get rid of some of the cows yeah and wanted to tax you in order to do it yeah there's weird people out there but see, as weird and as dumb as that is, there are people with that mentality that want to do evil to you. Amen. That makes them your enemy. 
Well, who's our enemy? Well, we know they're our adversary, the devil. But an adversary, the devil can't fight with me. He can only do what God wants to do to me. The devil has no power over me. I've been bought and purchased with the blood. I'm in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand. Don't make him pluck me out of the Father. The devil is not my enemy. He's an adversary. What's an adversary? I've given this illustration before. Tug of war. You're both pulling in opposite directions. He's trying to get us to let go of the rope. The only way that the devil wins is if either I let go of the rope or I put the rope down, or in some cases I never took the rope up. Then he went, because he's striving against us, what's in the balance? What's the rope? The souls of men. We're trying to take the gospel to those souls. We're trying to get those people into the house of God. He's trying to keep them out. That's not an enemy, that's an adversary. That's somebody that you're struggling against, you're striving against. An enemy is someone that is against everything that you stand for and will destroy you if given the opportunity. Well, the devil would destroy, but he can't unless God says so. So who are those that are our enemies? There are those that go out and they do evil. That's why sin had to be taken care of and addressed before we could get to God because sin made us the enemy of God. Because we embraced the very things that God hates. Sin. Those that do sin are our enemy. They, they may not sin against me, but they're the enemies of God. And if they're the enemies of the Father, they're my enemies. So when he's saying, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. He's saying there are evil people that want you to fail. There are those that will rejoice when you step in a mud puddle. Or when you fall down. When you're trying to live for God and they say, nope, he's not perfect. They're going to have a party over it. Maybe not outwardly, but inwardly. They're going to go home and they're going to say, you're not going to believe what happened today. Best thing ever. So and so slipped up. All that righteousness preaching that they did to me. All that goody two-shoeing is just a facade. Well, what's Mike? He says, rejoice not against me. When I fall, I shall arise. He's saying, I'm not perfect, but God will help me get up. I may fail him, but he'll help me get back to where I need to be so I can keep living for him. He's saying, if I sit in darkness, that means if I get to the point that I just, I give up, I can't figure out where I'm going, and I just finally sit down, darkness is all around me. He says, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Even when I don't know what's going on, God knows exactly what I need. I mean, did not the psalmist write, the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? Well, verse number nine, I will bear the indignation of the Lord. What's the indignation? Again, we can go to the New Testament. There's righteous indignation. That's what Jesus was filled with when he drove the money changers out of the house of God. Filled with righteous indignation. Indignation is God's action because of his judgment. Okay, now, back up here. Micah's saying, I understand. I'm not perfect. He says, what makes me different from those that are living wicked out there is God has showed me that I've got things in my life that I need to get taken care of, but I want to address them. In order to not be the enemy of God, we have to face the indignation of God. God may judge that, well, you need to get this out of your life. The indignation is God convincing you that you need to get it out of your life. That's called conviction. That's the easy way to do it. Because the hard way to do it is fire and brimstone like he poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they would not realize that what they were doing was evil. Because they did not listen to the judgments and the standards of God. And there's a whole bunch more. Everybody except Noah and his family. They saw the wrath of God because they would not listen to the judgment of God and because they would not be convinced by the indignation of God. God's angry with the wicked every day, but God doesn't destroy them. Why? Because in his, indign in his loving kindness, he's trying to show them through indignation. Hey, the reason it happened, you reaped what you sowed because it was evil. 
I don't want that for you. But he does have to show us that we're wrong. The indignation of God is all those red X's that you used to get on your test because you didn't study. That was indignation. Because the teacher's judgment was, well, if I tell them that they're right when they're wrong, they're going to grow up and be an idiot. So they judged it was best to tell you the truth. Well, the indignation was when you got it back, and if you got a letter on it that wasn't an A, or in some people's houses, if you got a letter on it that wasn't a D, it was lower than that. That was indignation. That feeling that you had, if you cared about your grades, it was, I failed. I didn't do what I thought I did. What was it? It's a wake-up check. Because you didn't listen on all the homework. Well, hey, you need to be paying more attention to this. You probably need to study this a little bit more. You might want to learn a little bit more about this so that if an essay happens, you can, you know, give a little bit more of an answer. What was all of that? Those were the judgments. Those were the warning signs. Those were the calls. Well, then there's the ending. Well, then what's the wrath? Well, that's the report card. Well, what's the report card? That's final. That goes into the record books can't undo it once it's on the report card can't go back and change it well God's saying there's a report card coming one day so the indignation is to convince to show us I love you and I want the best for you but you've got to realize you've got a problem well Micah says I will bear the indignation of the Lord Lord pour it out on me so I know everything that you want me to do when you embrace it indignation's a whole lot easier to bear it's still going to hurt because you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that you did wrong against the holy God that loves you. That's what sin is. That's what iniquity is. It should break our heart that we sin against God. That we stepped in the mud puddle. That we found ourselves in darkness. It should hurt us that we hurt God. But he's saying, I will bear that indignation because I have sinned against it. Because I know I deserve worse. I deserve hellfire. And if the indignation of God is what I must bear in order to get back in fellowship with God, he's saying, I'll bear it happily. Because as much as the indignation may hurt, it doesn't hurt as bad as knowing I disappointed God. Amen. And he says, until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. In other words, he's saying, I'm not leaning on my own understanding. I'm trusting in the Lord with all my heart I'm letting him call the shots that's the judgment but he's going to plead my cause meaning not because of who I am he doesn't say that he would plead him he said he'd plead his cause well what's my cause well when the devil you know like we heard that Sunday when the devil goes before God and he says hey Jordan's a no good, filthy, rotten, dirty sinner. He deserves hell. But the father says, well, yeah, it's true. Sin is sin. And then he turns to Jesus. He says, what do you have to say about it? He says, well, see, he may have been, but he ain't no more. He pleads his cause. He says he was bought with a price. His life's no longer his own. His cause is our cause because he's engraved in the palm of my hands. He's engraved in my feet. His name is in my side. Right? Jesus said, I bore in my body the marks of the cross so that he could wear that robe of righteousness. We could put that crown on his head. He's going to be one day at the marriage supper, Father. That's his cause. He's not there yet, but one day he will be. Father says, all right, close case. In Micah's day, it was... That's one of God's chosen people and he's doing what, to the best of his ability, what God instructed him to do. Well, I may be bought with the blood, but unless I get all those things cleared up, unless I listen and suffer the indignation of God so that I can get those things made right according to the judgment of God, if there's unrepented sin or an iniquity in my life, that's what we're talking about. I want to have fellowship with God. Jesus would say, well, Father, he's, he's bought, but he's got things he ain't repented of. He's going to have to reap what he sowed. 
even if we repent of it I may have to deal with the consequences I mean I can't cut the let's say metaphorically spiritually your spirituality is a car you cannot cut the brake lines say God I'm sorry for cutting the brake lines and then expect the car to stop when you get to the stop sign you got to fix some things you got to deal with it it may have been a problem that you knew about it may have been a problem you didn't know about again we're going to use Christian as an example Christian had a car with the brake lines that he didn't know it but they were in some pretty bad shape they were corroding and one day he hit the brake and the brake lines exploded because they were so corroded and he had to use the uh, parking brake all the way home as his only form of braking and I said better you than me At one time in that 96 Honda Civic that I had as my first car, Brother Peter will tell you, I let it get to where one of the brake pads just disappeared because it disintegrated. Every time I hit the brake, it swerved and veered because one tire was braking and the other ones weren't. Well, what happened? Well, Brother Peter had to help me put on a, a new brake caliper because by brake, I mean, help me, I mean, he did it and I watched him. And uh, I had used that so often without a brake pad that it seized up and I needed a new one because it was trying to stop but it couldn't right well God can plead my case but if I've got unrepentant sin he's going to plead the case and find out I'm guilty of things that I haven't been sorry for well what's he going to do he's going to pour out more indignation and if it goes further without being addressed because he doesn't want me to hit the brakes and swerve off the road because he doesn't want me to hit the brakes and the brake lines to bust and you know I end up in a telephone pole or something God's trying to throw up as many red flags as possible but he will bring his wrath if that's what it takes because he does chasten those that he loves if you're without chastisement you're a bastard not a son so if you're his wrath is coming but Micah's saying I'll suffer indignation because I don't want the wrath because I love him too much to not get things fixed because his relationship with me means so much that I've forsaken everything in the world and what they think is valuable and going after other people he's saying my eyes are set on heavenly things not earthly things he will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness that's why he's willing to suffer it is it easy bearing my cross every day no but Jesus told me to take up my cross daily and follow him is it easy crucifying the flesh to that cross every single day no because if it was easy I'd crucify it once and it'd be taken care of that's why I have to bring the cross with me to keep crucifying the flesh every day and I have to take it with me because I can't get rid of this flesh but I can take him with me and he can take care of the flesh I can take Christ in this new creature and let him live through me instead of me trying to live for Christ that's never going to work my best isn't good enough but if I allow Christ to live in me that is good enough why because I want to don't want to be in the darkness I want to be brought to the light so you notice in verse number 8 he said when I sit in darkness the Lord shall be a light unto me there's always light here but it's one thing to have light it's another thing to be in the light He's saying, I want him to bring me so close that I don't need the flashlight anymore because he is the light. I want to get so close that the light that is a lamp under my feet, the one that does show me the way, it gets a little dim because I'm so close to him. That's what he's begging for. He's saying, I shall behold his right. I want to get so close that I can see what Peter, James, and John saw in the Mount of Transfiguration. I want to get so close to him that my mind just gets blown. Well, verse number 10 goes on to say that after he sees his righteousness, everybody else essentially in the land will realize there was something to everything that Michael was talking about. I mean, I said it last week. Moses got so close, his face started glowing. Jacob got so close that he walked with a limp for the rest of his life as a token of the fact that he did get so close to God. 
But those that get close and do business with God, their life is forever changed afterwards. Those that get so close to Him that they behold His righteousness, they take a little bit of His righteousness with them because it's so valuable to them. I mean, if we want to use Hollywood's version of it, anybody seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? They didn't even get to see His righteousness. They just supposedly found the Ark of the Covenant and that one dude's face melted and the other one exploded. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. You know why it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie? Because that's what would happen if God revealed himself to mankind. Everything would just disintegrate. Because he's so holy. He's so righteous. He's saying, I just want to get a glimpse of it so much that that's what inspires and drives me for the rest of my life. But here's the thing. If you don't love him, you'll never get to see the righteousness. Because what he instructed us to seek his face. There are a lot of people out there looking for God. But unless you're looking for God for the right reason, you're not going to find him. Notice, Micah, in verse number 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. He understands, every day I fail God. I deserve the indignation. It's only the mercy and grace of God that I don't suffer the wrath of God every day. He's saying, I wake up every day and beg God to judge me. He's saying, Lord, I know what the world will turn me into if I turn myself over to it. So judge me. Bring your indignation, your conviction upon me to show me that this is what I need to get taken care of. Because I can rationalize a whole bunch of stuff. I can come up with a whole bunch of things and tell you why that that's my conviction and that God doesn't have a problem with it. But the truth is, if God convinces me of it, it doesn't matter all my reasoning all the things that I can come up with, I'm just going to let it go because he's convinced me I don't need it. I mean, I can tell you all day long that you need to cut your grass in a soup, which one, don't do that. People will think you're weird. Two, that's a good way to ruin a whole bunch of suits, especially if you're wearing dress shoes. I'd hate to polish those after you got done mowing the grass. Well, what's the point? I could give you a bunch of... It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. You know what's right and what's wrong. And for a man to know to, that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him in his sin. That's what the age of accountability is. When you come to the understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Because then you realize, I have done wrong. That's a different age for each person. Some people will never come to that age. Because they have mental disabilities. Because their faculties cannot understand the difference between right and wrong. But those that do, they know, I failed. They may not know what they failed, which is the righteousness and the standard of God. But they do know that they're not perfect. Well, Micah is saying, I deserve the indignation. I will bear it because I deserve worse. Why? So that every day he can show me how to get closer to his righteousness. I'm not going to be righteous, but I can get closer to his righteousness. Notice, he's not trying to get out of what everybody else... He's not saying, Lord, bring, bring wrath upon everybody else because I'm closer to your righteousness than them. No, his burden was he didn't want Israel to be this anymore. He wanted them to turn from these ways so that they wouldn't face the wrath of God. He's saying, God's already pronounced judgment. Lord, I'll bear the indignation. I'm praying that you show the indignation to them and that they finally get it. Why is he doing He's doing it out of love. Love for his God, love for others. And he's saying, God, I love you so much, I want to get closer to you, and I know that I'm not perfect, so show me where I'm not perfect. He's not doing it for the perks. He's doing it to get closer to God. He's not doing it so that when he's in that dark cave, that light will be there for him. He's saying, Lord, I, I don't want to be in the dark cave because the dark cave is not where you're at. You're up on the mountain. You're up shining a light for everybody to see. That's not down in the cave. So Lord, if I end up in the cave, I want to get out of the cave. And I know that you can lead me out of it. He's not saying that, Lord, I want to fall all the time. He's saying, Lord, I know I'll fall, but I also know that if I have my faith and trust in you, you'll pick me back up again. He's not saying, I'm, I'm doing it so that when I fall, I can get back up and say, ha ha, 
you would have broke your leg and stayed down. They're saying, Lord, I may have broken my leg, but I know you've got the balm of Gilead and I can keep on going. This is not a message of hate. It's not a message of judging those other people. It's just saying, it's wicked out there and I know I can't trust them people. Let God be true and every man a liar. You really don't know who you can trust because if everybody were to give themselves over to their heart, our hearts are deceitfully wicked, no man can know it, they'd give themselves over to do evil with both hands earnestly. So it's not about, well, he couldn't trust those people around him. We don't know who we can trust. Except one person. His name's Jesus. So, all that put together, the psalmist, or the songwriter, said it best this way, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Micah got a taste of the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, and he realized nobody could do for me what God did. Nobody out there can do what God can do for me. Is it always pleasant? No, but not because of him. That's because I mess up, because I sin, because I'm still in a flesh that strives against the things of God. It's my enemy. But he's so good that even in my weakness, even in my faults, he picks me back up. He leads me out of dark caves so that I can get closer to his righteousness so I can live more like him and shine a light to others so that God is glorified, edified, and praised because of what I do and because of that light that's shining, he can reach people. He may have me drop some salt to salt the earth to preserve them. Maybe to give a little bit of indignation to somebody. But if everything that I'm doing is for God, I know I'm getting closer to Him. To see His righteousness. To be in light. Not just to shine in light. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.